All right, Alexander, there's been a lot of talk about nuclear weapons, tactical nukes, dirty bombs. Um, everyone is talking. Well, everyone in the collective West seems to be talking about nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, to be fair, Russia doesn't really bring up the subject unless they're talking about uh, defending Russia. And, they don't, and they, they're very careful not to use the word nuclear weapons as well. They just pretty much say that they're going to defend uh, Russia. It is it, the West. The West is completely obsessed with nuclear weapons. After um, Putin gave his his uh, his Q and A, his speech and his Q and A at uh, Valdai, Biden uh, took an interview. It was like three four hours after the the Valdai uh, conference, the forum wrapped up, and um, Biden was asked about. Uh, Putin's statements during the the Valdai, where he said that you know Russia's not doesn't have a need to use nuclear weapons. You know we've got this this conflict well under control, so all this nuclear stuff is is silly. Actually, Putin even joked about it a bit when the uh, moderator asked him about nuclear weapons. He he struck a pose and he was in like deep thought, and everyone was kind of like at the edge of the seat, and then he. He came out of that thought laughing and he's like, you know, I got all you guys. You guys thought I was going to say something very, very scary or something like that. I mean, he, he was joking around about it, which was interesting. He was diffusing a very tense uh, subject, I think. Um, but when Biden was asked about the nuclear uh, comments or the lack of uh, nuclear comments from Putin, Biden said this. He said, if he has no intention, why does he keep talking about it? Why does he talk about the ability to use a tactical nuclear weapon? He's been very dangerous in how he's approached this. He can end this all, get out of Ukraine. And at the same time, Alexander, we have the U.S., the Pentagon's new national defense strategy, where they are uh, rejecting any limits on using nuclear weapons in, uh, in various situations, especially when dealing with uh, threats. And those threats were clearly outlined in this document as being Russia and China. So it looks like mad, mutual, uh, mutual assured uh, destruction. It seems like that's being called off by the Pentagon in a way. I mean, nukes are on the table now, according to this new defense strategy for any situation that, yeah. uh, that the Pentagon feels uh, they're needed. Absolutely. Well, can I just first of all speak about what Biden said? Because, of course, Putin has never at any time said or hinted that Russia was going to use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, so when Biden says, why does Putin constantly talk about this? He's never talked about it. He's never said it, nor has any other Russian official. The people who talk about Russia using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine and have done so incessantly and have been doing so for months is not the Russians. It is people in the West, including, of course, Biden himself, just as he just did again when basically when he straightforwardly misrepresented what Putin had said or in fact had not said uh, for you know the upteenth time. And this is this is very, very typical, not just of Biden, but of this administration. A couple of months ago, before this conflict started, back in January, Britain, France, the United States, Russia, and I believe China all published a joint statement in which said they said that nuclear war was something that must never be fought and which cannot be won. And that was a formula that was developed actually during the detente era of the Cold War. The point being that nuclear weapons were far too dangerous. And Biden made statements at the time which appeared to endorse that. And here we have, here we are, just a few months later, a new strategy paper, which was certainly being worked on, by the way, um, uh, last year. In other words, when that joint statement was published by the nuclear powers. And what it says is, well, the United States actually is considering situations where it might use nuclear weapons, not in defence against nuclear weapons that might be used against itself, but in certain tactical and conventional situations, which it doesn't really spell out. So the United States is moving steadily. I say the United States. I mean, the neocons who are in charge, the civilians, I suspect, in the Pentagon, who the administration has put in place, 
they're already intellectually, conceptually laying the groundwork for a situation in which nuclear weapons can be used. So Biden says one thing. His administration does the exact opposite. All this happens in the space of a few months. And is it surprising that countries like Russia, China, other countries are becoming increasingly mistrustful of what this administration says and are becoming increasingly alarmed at how dangerous it's becoming? Yeah, these, uh, these children are uh, in, in uh, the Pentagon and the State Department and, and all over the Biden administration. They're very, very dangerous. These are very dangerous uh, children. How does uh, Russia and China, how do they respond to this change in, uh, in doctrine? Well, they're going to build up their own nuclear forces. I mean, we've already seen the Russians take various steps in that respect. They've built up their uh, submarine force. Um, I've, just, I've done programs about the Poseidon underwater drone, nuclear-powered underwater drone, which could be used to launch um, um, undersea attacks on coastal American cities with devastating consequences. We'll be seeing much more of that. And I'm afraid it's going to become increasingly difficult in this kind of atmosphere for, to persuade the Russians to engage in any more arms control agreements with the United States. Because what happens is the United States signs these arms control agreements. Very often the Russians, in response, um, cancel or terminate you know, their own programs. Sometimes they do away with weapon systems that they're developing. And then after a few years, the United States repudiates these agreements and presses forward with its plans. So at this point, trust is so poor that there's very little chance now, it seems to me, of future arms control programs being agreed. And as for the Chinese, well, again, they're straightforward about this. They've been talking about this very openly now in their media. They're pressing forward with their nuclear buildup, and it's, and it's on a huge scale. And, of course, a few months ago, they tested um, a hypersonic glide vehicle, which uh, created alarm in the United States. We are in a nuclear arms race, a very dangerous nuclear arms race, between the United States and two nuclear superpowers. In the Cold War, the United States was racing against one nuclear superpower, which was the Soviet Union, whose manufacturing capacity the United States greatly exceeded. This time, the United States is racing against two nuclear superpowers, both of which are combining against it, and their industrial and manufacturing capacity greatly exceeds that of the United States. So the neocons are rushing the United States into a nuclear arms race against an adversary that is better placed to outproduce it than um, we have seen at any time since the end of the Cold, the Cold War, the Second World War. It's a very, very dangerous situation. And given how reckless these people are, one worries that if they sense that nuclear superiority is shifting away from the United States, they might be tempted to use nuclear weapons quickly whilst they still think that America has some advantage. Right. Um, this is because the U.S., has no answer for the hypersonic uh, weapons. I mean, the, the U.S. is testing hypersonic uh, missiles as well, but they're way behind in this. I mean, well, I've, I've read reports. I've, I've heard analysts say it's going to take at least seven years. I, yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah. I, I've heard that range between five and seven years for the U.S. Absolutely. to catch up. But as they're catching up, the Chinese yeah. and the Russians, I'm they, moving they, they move I'm forward. Moving forward. Indeed. So um, with this, a bigger this, with a bigger industrial capacity, always remember that. Yeah, th this is the only way. This is the only way, perhaps that uh, that the Pentagon uh, can see in order to to somehow um, position themselves 
for a potential conflict with Russia or China. The only way they can do this is if they just tear up whatever agreements you know they've had and just say, okay, now nukes are are acceptable in any situation. Is is that how they're they're Absolutely. viewing this? Absolutely. And the other thing they're doing, which is extremely alarming and very destabilizing, is that they're forward deploying nukes. So they're bringing more more nukes to Europe. We've just had that confirmation that a lot of nukes are being supplied to Europe. There's now discussion about deploying nukes in Finland. It's been denied, of course, but, you know, we see, as I said, that the US, or at least this administration, denies one thing one day and then goes ahead and does it the next. <clears throat> anyway, they've been talking about, there's talks now about, you know, the ability of Finland to change its laws, change its constitution, so as to allow the US to deploy nuclear weapons in Finland, just a couple of hundred kilometers from St. Petersburg. Okay, so that, that kind of escalation everywhere, you, you can imagine this happening. I mean, you know, nuclear weapons in Taiwan? I mean, that wouldn't be Cuban Missile Crisis 2. That would be, that would conceivably trigger World War Three because, of course, if the Chinese got the sense that the US was about to deploy, forward deploy nuclear weapons to Taiwan, I mean, there would be an immediate Chinese military reaction. And um, given that nuclear weapons would, in that case, have already been thought about, because, you know, if you're going to forward deploy nuclear weapons, then you're already thinking about it. The risk of an uncontrolled escalation becomes ever greater. But that is the kind of mindset that we're going into. It is unbelievably dangerous. It is dangerous beyond anything one can imagine. And can I just say, I was in a discussion um, a few, about a week ago, 10 days ago, with a, involving a British academic. And I, I, I can't verify this, but this was, he said this in an open venue. I mean, you know, there were people watching, listening. And he said that he tracks what's been going on in literature, in films. And he said that there's now been a systematic policy of going back over old films and old books and editing, you know, I'm talking about works of fiction now, and editing out of them references to nuclear weapons. Right. A most, a very Orwellian and incredibly dangerous practice. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny that uh, the Biden uh, White House, well, not the Biden White House, the Democrats, Democratic Party, and, and all of these neoliberals, they were they were screaming about Trump and nuclear weapons, right? So they went on and on about that. Oh, Trump, is, he's, he's going to use nukes, and he's got his finger on the, on the button, and he's unstable, and all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, it's these guys that are ramping up for, uh, for a nuclear conflict. What happens if uh, you mention Taiwan, and they get, uh, they get nuclear weapons forward deployed to, to Taiwan? What happens, though, if Finland does eventually get nuclear weapons. I it's very Russia, possible. I, I think, I, I, very, I, don't think I don't think people, I, yeah, I don't think people should brush this story aside or believe the, the denials. I, I, I reported on this story when I read it and at first you think, ah, oh, it's not going to happen. But I think it's very, very possible that Finland is, uh, I was going to say strong armed, but it seems like the Finnish government is, is doing this very happily. I mean, it seems like they're full speed ahead with this escalation. So what happens uh, if they get uh, nuclear weapons forward deployed? I, I, I'm not even going to try and guess. I mean, the, the, the Russians will, um, will react very negatively is a massive understatement. But what they might do, I, I'm not even going to try to guess what they might do. I mean, it's, it's certainly from a Russian point of view. I mean, I, I would have thought that was a red line. And I would have thought that the Russians are already trying to communicate that fact to both the Finns and to the United States. I, I'm going to say straight away, I, I, like yourself, believe that these denials are unconvincing and that forward deployment of nuclear weapons to Finland is actually the plan. I mean, they're not going to be able to deploy nuclear weapons in Ukraine. I mean, that isn't going to happen now because the Russians moved in to prevent that happening. So I think they're now looking at wanting to do that in Finland instead. And that's the only reason 
realistically, why they would want Finland in NATO, because Finland has nothing to add to NATO, but they probably do want to put nuclear weapons in Finland to counter Russia. Now, the closest we got to that, by the way, was in the early 1960s, <clears throat> when the United States deployed nuclear weapons to Turkey and Italy. But of course, particularly the Soviets were really, really worried about the nuclear weapons which were deployed in, it, in, in Turkey. And that was one of the steps which led directly to the Cuban Missile Crisis, because the Soviets wanted in part to have their own nuclear weapons close to the United States to balance the ones that the United States had in Turkey. And, of course, we all remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, whose 60th anniversary, by the way, has just passed. <laughs> it was just a couple of days ago. And that very, very came unbelievably close to an all-out nuclear exchange. And as only became known decades later, um, JFK, in order to defuse the nuclear we uh, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, um, agreed with the Soviets that the Soviets would withdraw their nuclear weapons from Cuba and the US, in return, would remove its nuclear weapons from Finland. So, you know, one can from easily Turkey. imagine... From Turkey. From Turkey, sorry, from, from Turkey. Turkey. From Turkey, exactly. Uh, though that was, that was kept secret at the time because both the Soviets and the Americans knew that if it was made public, um, Kennedy's political position in the United States might crumble. But, I mean, JFK had the courage to make that move. Um, it's entirely possible that if we start to see nuclear weapons being deployed in Finland, that the Russians will take counter countermeasures, um, you know, forward deployment of their own nuclear forces closer to the United States. And I'm not going to even try and speculate about scenarios because I think even talking about these things at this time would be a dangerous thing to do. Yeah. The leadership in Finland lied from the get-go. Oh, when they talked absolutely. about NATO, Santa Marin, when she talked about NATO, God, like five, six months ago, she was very, she specifically said, we're not going to have any troops. We're not going to have any weapons. It's just about being part of the alliance. That's when they first started to talk about it. Here we are now, six, seven, eight months later, and they're talking about putting nukes in Finland. So they've been, they have been lying from the very, very beginning. Beginning. That's why I think they're going to lie some more, and they're going to try yes. to actually put nuclear weapons there. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I mean, I mean, that is the most dangerous thing of all because. Um, Doing one thing is bad. Lying about what you're doing in international relations, particularly at this level, is worse still. I come back to these meetings between Xi Jinping and, um, and um, Biden. And, you know, the Chinese readouts of these meetings say straightforwardly. They, they don't use those words, but, you know, you don't have to pass them very much. Uh, Xi Jinping said to Biden, you're lying to me. I, you know, you're telling me that you support the one China policy over Taiwan and everything you're doing shows that you are really intending the opposite. And I understand that over the course of the conversations between Putin and Biden that took place in the run up to the conflict in Ukraine, Putin came to the same conclusion. Biden at one point assured him that the United States had no intention of installing nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And that was at one meeting, and Putin came away reassured. And then Putin pressed Biden on that very same topic in the subsequent meeting. And he came away with the impression that Biden was evading clear answers, and that what Biden had said in the previous meeting was straightforwardly a lie. And that was one of the factors that apparently hardened Putin's intentions and beliefs that some kind of operation in Ukraine was inevitable because sooner or later uh, NATO nuclear weapons would, would, would appear there. So that, that's where we are now. Even if, 
a new American administration comes in, one determined to, you know, sort out relations with the Chinese and the Russians, to try and stabilise the situation, to bring us back to some kind of detente system. Um, it's going to have to overcome this enormous distrust, this uh, disbelief that there is now in uh, Beijing and Moscow, that, you know, what Americans say it, 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 it is reliable. When we went through that, this whole period in the 60s, when we went from the confrontations in the 50s, the Berlin crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and all that sort of thing, when we got to the point where in the mid-1960s, the US was starting to push the Soviets in particular for detente, there was a minimal trust between the superpowers. If, uh, you know, Brezhnev spoke to um, Johnson or Nixon, he could be confident that whatever Brezhnev, whatever Johnson or Nixon agreed to, the United States might abide by. So, you know, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, anti-ballistic missile treaty, SALT-1, SALT-2, the negotiations could go forward in good faith. Now, nobody believes that that good faith is there any longer. And that makes negotiations in any foreseeable future all but impossible. Yeah. Not only that, on a final note, uh, you also have the factor that NATO is, is going to be defeated in Ukraine. It's inevitable. Yeah. Yes. NATO is going to lose in Ukraine. Yes. And Stoltenberg uh, came out with a statement the other day, and he said that uh, NATO can't lose in Ukraine because that would that would mean the, the end of NATO. That's how he kind of hinted at. He said, we have to win in Ukraine because NATO's existence depends on it. That's what Stoltenberg uh, said. I'm paraphrasing it. That's what he, that's what he uh, came he out with. That. So when, when they... When they get defeated in Ukraine, when NATO is defeated in Ukraine, and it is inevitable, NATO will lose to Russia in Ukraine. Uh, the only move that they have left, because they can't expand anywhere else. Once, once Ukraine is locked up, there's nowhere. They, they, they can't go to Georgia. They can't expand further east. The only way they can go is, is, is the Finland route. Absolutely. Can I say that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly right, and that's why we're now seeing all these moves, because uh, despite what Stoltenberg says, there are some people in Washington who the, the are... The Sweden-Finland route. Yeah. Exactly, the, the Scandinavian route, exactly, and that is exactly what they're going to do. By the way, on that topic of what Stoltenberg says, remember before we, with the conflict started, we did a programme in which one of the questions you put to me wasn't a question. You said uh, that NATO is going to bitterly regret investing in Ukraine, investing its entire credibility in Ukraine of all places. Do you remember putting that comment to me? And now we see Stoltenberg coming along and saying, if we, if, if we lose in Ukraine, NATO's credibility is shot. Well, perhaps, Mr. Stoltenberg, he might have spoken, you know, he might have spoken to you. If he'd listened to what you said, he, he would should have, have been watched in this us. situation. <laughs> He should have watched it. He wouldn't be in this situation. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> what can you say? Let's see if the what midterms, the up and coming. Well, indeed. I mean, I mean, I mean, there is something. still, there is still, there is still some time to stop this train. But um, unless that, unless those the brakes are put on very soon, it'll become a runaway train. And then, as I said, the whole thing is looking incredibly dangerous. I mean, Putin, in his Valdai speech, did say that the next 10 years are the most important since the Second World War, and they're going to be extremely dangerous. And you can, you can see why, he's, why he would say that, because, frankly, they are becoming so. And the really dangerous moves are being taken by the small group of people in the United States, without any wider consultation. I mean, most Americans are not even aware of all of this. Yeah. All right, we will leave it there at the duran.locals.com. We are also now on Rockfin. You can find the link down below. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.